Welcome to In Their 20s, a podcast created for people in their 20s. Today we spoke with Jason Dumas, who is the sports director and an anchor at Cronfer News in the Bay Area. After graduating from Syracuse University, Jason had an opportunity to work at ESPN as a production assistant. So let's jump in with Jason to hear about his best advice for people in their 20s. Jason, really excited to speak with you today about your professional career and journey um, in reporting, journalism, broadcasting, all that. We're really excited. Um, I personally love these interviews, of course, because I graduated graduated with a communications major uh, from Nepal University. So I did see you also um, graduated with a public communications major from Syracuse. I think the best place to begin for the interview is just to discuss your experience at Syracuse, uh, some of your favorite classes, uh, maybe even a professor that you really loved while at Syracuse. Yeah, well, first and foremost, fellow Big East school. I, you know, I know Syracuse is in the ACC now, but I'll always acknowledge it as a Big East school. It was a Big East school when I went there, when my parents went there. Um, so I remember there used to be a lot of battles between Syracuse and DePaul. They had this guy named Jeremy Hazel, who was so good when I was in college. But uh, anyway, to your actual question, um, my favorite classes and favorite professors. So I had two favorite professors who stick out immediately. One by the name of John Nicholson. He's a pretty big figure at Syracuse. Uh, he's since retired, but he was uh, uh, Syracuse. It was a little after I graduated. They started this new house sports uh, program, I guess. There's essentially a, a program to uh, to help network um, all the broadcast journalism majors who went into sports. And he ran that. Uh, that was after I left. But, um, you know, we we were always close at Syracuse. Um, you know, actually I had a different advisor and I came to him one day. I was like, hey man, like my, my advisor, it's a nice guy, but sometimes I, it, it, it's a little too hard to get a hold of him. And I don't think that should be the case, paying all this money for Syracuse. I, I don't expect someone to be my personal secretary, but uh, I shouldn't have to hound somebody to, you know, get a hold of them, get advice, be an advisor. It's like, can I transfer, can I, Make it so you're my advisor. You know, you have to fill out paperwork and whatnot. He was like, he gave me straight up. He was like, well, yeah, um, if I'm going to be your advisor, uh, you're going to have to do these things. And he just lifted off a bunch of stuff like uh, you're going to have to, you know, be in communication with me, with all your classes, how you're doing, your internships. Like there's expectations that I have for you and you're going to have to reach them. Uh, and I was like, whoa, it was like actually the polar opposite of my other one. It was almost, it was almost a little pressure. So I was like, for sure. Cause you know, I knew he had the best interests of his students, especially the ones where he took under his wing. So he took me under his wing and you know, he was a legend. He'd done everything in the broadcast business, uh, before he became a professor and he, uh, he's very, uh, quite frank. So he would tell tell you things how they are uh he's not for the faint of heart but that's that's very necessary in this business so the fact that he uh he was like that to me while I was still in college I think it was very very beneficial to me um uh, and I, we still we still talk now you know he's he's on my resume if I ever apply for jobs or whatnot all I got to do is shoot him a text hey this tv station might call you you know and he's like I got you um, and then Professor uh, Susan Lysak, she's she's not at Syracuse anymore. She's at a school in Southern California, I believe. But um, she was just uh, uh, another one of those professors who you could tell she really cared about her students, and uh, she would take she would use her free time to help you if you asked. And uh, you know, all her feedback was super insightful. Uh, so those I'd say were my two favorite professors. And in terms of favorite classes, I didn't really have a favorite class. You know, it was just, I know most of the, most of my journalism classes in Newhouse, I know they were tailored for me to, uh, you know, get jobs and whatnot, but really the best experience is life experience and internships. Uh, so I learned a lot in my classes, don't get me wrong, but uh, they were more like almost like a formality, like, hey, take these classes, so you can know the X's and O's, but you're gonna get your real in-depth learning uh, 
with some of the clubs that you join and internships that you take. So those are, those were my two favorite professors. I didn't really have a favorite class per se. Yeah, I love that though. Because I agree with you. I um, also really, really bonded strongly with professors that had the industry experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, been in the field of communication, marketing, whatever it might have been, um, and they really know, you know, what they needed to teach in the class because they have that industry knowledge. Uh, and there's something that you also brought up, just the whole point of, um, you know, experience being the best teacher. Totally agree with you with that. Uh, me, myself, I had 10 internships while in college, um, really soaked it up like a sponge. I mean, I think that you need to have unique experiences um, at different companies, different jobs to really gain that strong knowledge. And that's something that I did notice on your LinkedIn. You've had some really cool internships and then also a lot of cool postgrad experiences as well. Uh, one of those stood out, um, production assistant at ESPN. Yeah. I would love to hear um, about what you took away from that experience and just how exciting it was working for ESPN. Oh man, it was dope. And that was a full-time job. That wasn't an internship. That was, that was a big boy job. That was actually my first job out of college. Um, out of Syracuse. So I, I moved to moved to Central Connecticut. I wasn't in Bristol. I was in a surrounding town. It was a quick drive to campus though. Um, that was great because it really taught me the uh, it really taught me the other end of TV. I knew I I knew I always had on air aspirations. So I knew I wasn't going to be at ESPN super long. Um, but it really taught me how to produce and you know, this is the first time in my career here in San Francisco where I've had my own producer. So leading up to this and all the other stops I've made on air, I was producing my own shows, uh, my own sports cast and my own shows. We have, you know, hour long, 30 minute shows weekly at some of the stations uh, that I've worked at sports shows and I've, I've produced them myself. Uh, and I really got, I really got good at, at producing you know, television from ESPN. All we did was produce highlights, produce teases, produce openings, produce closings. You know, um, I would always get a lot of feedback from the high soups and the, you know, coordinating producers at ESPN. Uh, so that was probably what was most beneficial to me. And then the networking was great. You know, some of some of my mentors and friends who I still keep in contact with to this day, uh, I met at ESPN. You know, and uh, this is a business where networking is almost as almost as key as your talent. You know, I'm not going to say it's more key, but, you know, it's, it's an industry where, like many things in life, is not what you know is who you know. And uh, a lot of my connections at ESPN have been able to connect me with other people or pass me this person's email address or put in a good word for me to this person. Uh, those were the two most beneficial things about working for ESPN. And then it's also it's ESPN, you know, if growing up watching Sports Center every morning, seeing some of the people who I used to watch on TV all the time, it was kind of surreal in the beginning, you know, the first, you know, first two months or so. I'm sitting in meetings and working side by side next to guys like Jerry Rice. Uh, Cordell Stewart, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. Like a lot of the analysts and stuff who were there, I would, I would cut video for them. You know, when you see, when you see, you know, someone on NFL live per se, uh, breaking something down or giving his an opinion, we talk about that in the meeting before the show. And he's going to be like, all right, well, I really think this. So, you know, the, the CP will be like, all right, Jason, make sure you cut this B roll and this B roll for Cordell. I'm using Cordell Stewart as an example because he was someone who I worked with a lot. He's not at ESPN anymore. Um, but yeah, that was that was really cool. You're like, wow, I'm just casually working with these athletes. And you know, you know, after a while it became normal. And now, you know, over 10 years in the business, you know, being around people like that is normal. But uh when you're when you're a wide-eyed college student, freshly out of college, it's kind of surreal. First postgrad job in your 20s. I mean, that must have been remarkable and really does sound like it was amazing. Something that you said really stood out to me also. Um, and a lot of people say this line is cliche, but I always roll my eyes because I think it is really true. Your network is your net worth. Um, yeah. Really is who you know, um, plus what you know. 
Um, mm-hmm. you know, your network is really going to get you into new positions, new opportunities. Um, because of course, you know, you killed at ESPN and it led to so many other things for you. Um, so it's always who, you know, and just on the subject of, you know, the different jobs that you had, I did notice, of course, and we spoke about this a little at the beginning, um, you know, you've worked in Louisiana, North Dakota, Maryland, and now of course you're in the Bay area, my hometown, mm-hmm. it seems you have followed opportunity. Um, in different cities, you know, maybe cities that you have never been to before, where yeah. you're not from. I know for 20-somethings, that can be a little scary sometimes, mm-hmm. moving away to a new city, um, whether it's for college or even for a new job. I would right. love to hear about what you learned and what you gained from following opportunity in different cities. Yeah, man, great question. Well, I've always had the, some, you know, some of the decisions I've made can be a little scary, overwhelming, uh, you know, I was comfortable at ESPN, you know, Uh, I had the itch though. I knew I wanted to be on air. So when you're not doing exactly what you want to do on a daily basis, you know, you can get irritable at work. You know, I just, I knew it was time for me to leave, but at the same time, when I get this job offer in Bismarck, North Dakota, it's like, it's all fun and games until like that choice is really staring you dead in your eye. And you're like, damn, I got to move to North Dakota. I'm a very family oriented person. Uh, Me and my family are close. Most of my friends are friendships that I've had since like knee high. And like, so, you know, I'm very, I have a very tight knit community around me. The people who I spend most of my time with, I know I moved to North Dakota. That's out the window. I might see them twice a year. Like it's just different. It's a lot. Uh, you know, so many other implications. I, I know it's not that diverse out there. I know it's freezing cold. Pretty much North Dakota, before I got there, and just knowing what I knew about North Dakota, had pretty much every characteristic of somewhere where I would never want to live. But you have this opportunity that can, you know, kind of catapult your career, start your career. So I just had this mentality like, I got to prove this was the right decision. I don't know if it's going to be. It could be hard, but you can't go out there and BS and, you know, just waste your time. If you're going to go move out to North Dakota and start your life out there, you start your career out there, you got to prove it's the right decision. You got to make it worth your while. And you also have to have in your mind that it's temporary. You know, it's like, I'm not going to be moving out to North Dakota for six years. It's going to be a year or two. I had a uh, I had an eighteen month contract. So I was like, it's going to be eighteen months, and then you're going to move to your next. And the only way you'll move to your next is if you make it worth it. So that's what I did. I got out there, man, and like, <clears throat> like I tell people this all the time, and they always laugh. Me and my mom always still laugh about this. It's like, when I moved out to North Dakota, I. I brought an air mattress out there for my room. I lived, you know, first I had my own little spot and then actually another Syracuse kid uh, moved to that city and we're like, hey, let's save some money, live together. Um, so I had pretty solid apartments, you know, it's not like I was, I was living like where like this was only what I could have, but I bring my air mattress out there and, you know, a couple of weeks go by and it's not even a nice air mattress. It was like, it had like a slow leak. I would have to like refill it every like, like maybe like once in the middle of the night, not not all night, but like once in the middle of the night, I'd have to go get the remote and like, you know, uh, refill it. So like a couple of weeks go by, my mom's like, hey, so you have you like bought a mattress yet? And I could afford one. It was, I'm not sitting here saying like, I couldn't afford a mattress. In Louisiana, I was dead broke. I could hardly afford anything for a while, but that's a different story. But at this juncture in North Dakota, I could afford a mattress, I could go buy. And I was like, you know what, mom? Like, nah, I'm not going to buy a mattress. I'm going to sleep on this air mattress. And my mom's like, you're crazy. Why? I'm like, I don't want to get comfortable. Like, I want to, it was just a mentality. It wasn't like I literally don't want to get comfortable. It was a mentality that, hey, I don't want to be comfortable out there, out here. This is temporary. I was like, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I still think you're crazy. So I was out there 16 months, you know, sleeping on an air mattress, blowing it up about once a night. And it was just one of those things like it just kept me like hey this is temporary like do your job well so you can get an opportunity to go elsewhere and you know after 16 months I got a 
I got a new job, but you know, it was, it was a great experience from a career standpoint and, you know, even a personal standpoint, I met some people out there who I'll be friends with the rest of my life. I had, I was really lucky uh, in terms of coworkers. A lot of my coworkers were young, you know, fresh out of school, like-minded social people. So we had a lot of fun. Uh, my boss, both of my bosses, my news director and my sports director, they were both uh, very tenured, uh, and they they both you know taught me a lot, and uh, it was honestly aside from having to live in North Dakota, um, it was honestly the perfect first station that you could work at. I really have no complaints. Like I said, North Dakota wasn't all that bad. It was more just being so far from my family and missing them, um, missing my friends and family. But other than that, you know, I made the most of it. I did what I had to do and I got up out of there. I think a lot of times people think, okay, like I just got moved to a new city for a new position. That's it. No, of course. I mean, you need, you need a plan. You need to do something while you're there. Yeah. You need to stand out. You need to work hard um, if you want that opportunity to lead to other opportunities. So clearly uh, when you moved to North Dakota, when you moved to Maryland, when you moved to all these places, you had a plan in mind. Um, so clear that, of course, you were sleeping on an air mattress in North, North Dakota with the intention of not being there for too long. Um, right. I really, really love that story a lot. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, so next question I have for you, thinking about, you know, all of the jobs that you've had within reporting, being an anchor, um, I would just like to really think about the the first feeling, you know, that you were when you were first on TV, how did that feel being on TV for the first time? Uh, reporting your first event. And then also, I want to ask about your most exciting story that you've ever worked on. Uh, man, I was nervous as hell. That first that first one, I, I, I'll i never forget the first time I anchored. Never will forget it. Um, you know, when I first started in North Dakota, I was just a reporter. Never, never was behind a desk. Then someone left and I got the weekend sports anchor gig. Um, so, and I think it's funny, my first time I anchored, it wasn't on a weekend. Our sports director was on assignment or on vacation. I can't remember what, but he wasn't in the studio. So I was filling in. So it was like, you know, it was like a Wednesday evening at six. So it was with the main, main news team, uh, tenured people, at some stations, like small stations like North Dakota, sometimes the main anchor is also the news director. So uh, I was on the desk with the, uh, my news director and who was also our main anchor. And she's as friendly as she can be. She can be a little intimidating, especially as a young, as a young, report, young journalist, you know, because uh, she was very, just very good at her job, very assertive. Um, so, you know me, I'm just like, oh, I'm so scared to mess up. And what made it worse, all my coworkers who are reporters, they came in the studio to watch my first sports cast. So I'm like nervous. I'm like, man, like, like there are like 12 people here in the studio just here watching. Um, but I got through it. I wish I could probably dig that archive up. I have no idea what it looked like. It was probably so bad. It'd probably be painful to watch, but I got through it. And it's just like anything, the more reps you get, the more comfortable you get. Um, but the nerves did last a little bit, you know, just cause I'm a perfectionist. It's not like, not that I'm like literally scared or something. I'm just nervous. Like I'm trying to do so, so well. And, you know, this is your dream, but that has subsided, you know, that subsided before I even left North Dakota. Um, and then I guess my favorite story, man, that's a hard question to ask because I've probably turned, I've probably turned over over 400 feature stories in my career. It's just tough. Um, it's been a couple, like, you, know, you know, so to fit my, my favorite feature story here in, in San Francisco is because it's just fresh of mine. I did it, I think my first year out here, I'm going on like year three now. Uh, I just did a story, this local kid from Oakland, him and his brother, their bond and um, his, his brother's now just finished his sophomore year in college, so, and I did this when he was a senior in high school. Um, the kid, he committed to play basketball at a D1 school on the anniversary where his brother was shot, I, I think it was eight times. Um, his brother was a really good basketball player in his own right, then he got shot. 
Um, now I can't play basketball anymore. He was supposed to be paralyzed from the waist down, but he walks again, uh, which is great. Just it, it speaks to what type of kid he is. And um, I just, you know, I told their story of how it happened and how important it was for him to commit on that day. And then I did a follow-up story like a year later when this kid, because now the kid is a wheelchair basketball player and he was gifted a state-of-the-art wheelchair. And the follow-up story was so great you know, especially given the initial story and I still keep in contact with that family. And, you know, so that's probably been the one of, that's probably, you know, that might take the cake for all. I might be forgetting some stuff because I've done so many, but that's probably my favorite feature story I've ever turned just on, on, you know, those two brothers and their family and their family was so appreciative. And, you know, we still talk and it reminded me like, you know, you can make a difference just by storytelling, you know, and, uh, you know, I felt really good after it. I'm not going to lie. You know, I didn't do it for that purpose. I did it because it was such an enticing story. But as you're telling it, as you're shooting it, as you're writing it, you start realizing like how impactful it can be. And, uh, you know, that was a really great one. And the fact that I still have a relationship with them and it's like, and it just happened so organically, uh, I would have to say, yeah, that, that's my favorite story I've ever covered. Sounds like a very touching story. I'm going to try and locate that one and link it to our, our interview. Yeah, yeah I, have, check it out. I can uh, I can shoot you a link to both the um, the initial one and then the follow-up one. Yeah, and if you do end up finding the uh, archive of your first <laughs> on-air uh, feature, let me know too so we can link that. that yeah, I'd like have to cool. I'd have to holler at uh, the people at that station still, and yeah. I you know I know a few, few people over there too, but that'll be an interesting watch. <laughs> of course. So, Jason, final question for you now. Um, I want to talk about today. So, of course, as you just mentioned, you've been at um, Cron Four News in San Francisco Bay Area now, going on three years. Congratulations, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Uh, you. And you are the sports director, anchor, reporter there. Um, I just really want to take some time to reflect. I mean, just on the entire career leading up to this moment, um, how has Cron been for you? And then also, um, what's next? I mean, you know, thinking about your professional journey at Cron, I mean, right. another area of the business that you're interested in touching or maybe getting involved in, or uh, maybe even a feature that you're looking forward on work, working on uh, later this week or year. Yeah. Um, so the journey has been great, man. You know, I tell young, young professionals all the time because I was told this too, and it's so true. Uh, don't get so blinded on the end goal that you're not appreciating the day to day because it's a grind and sometimes you have to enjoy the fruits of your labor and sometimes you have to especially especially to get to the future you got to appreciate the present so uh man I wouldn't change my journey up to this point for anything there's been some lows you know where I was wondering am I good enough where I was wondering do I want to keep doing this you know do I want to work for this to do that you know there's been some lows and there's been some just euphoric highs where I'm like covering the NBA finals where I'm on the float of a Stanley Cup parade you know and I'm like this is what I work for where I'm sitting like reporting courtside next to like Stephen A. Smith watching him do his ESPN hits while I do my hits for Cron 4. There's some times like that where you just get butterflies and you chills and you just re remember why you're doing it. Um, so I wouldn't change the journey for anything you know it's, it's helped make me who I am you know I've I've had different perspectives on so many things because I've been able to live in so many different places, uh, just be engulfed in so many different cultures. And, you know, people in North Dakota are very different than the people in Southern Louisiana. And people in Central Maryland are very different from the people in Philly where I grew up. So I have so many different perspectives. I think it's helped, you know, make me a more well-rounded person. And well, what's in the future? You know, I mean, that's a good question. I, I have no idea. I'm very happy here at Crown Four. I feel like uh, they give me a, a platform that I I enjoy and, and, and that I think I deserve. And, you know, I'm just going to keep keep striving. You know, one of my mentors and friends he started out as a mentor and I still look to him for advice, but he's become a good friend of mine, Danny Pamels. He's out in Philly. Uh, you know, I... I used to be very much so like what's next, uh, especially earlier in my career. And I think that helped me 
Uh, but here at a city like San Francisco, where there's so much to cover and, you know, it's a great market. You know, I was talking to Danny one day and I was like, yeah, well, I want to do this next. I want to do that next. And he's like, man, from what it looks like, you're doing great work. You're killing it. Like, be focused on the present. If you do good work, those people will find you, you know, your next opportunity will come knocking at your door. Now, don't be complacent or anything, but it was basically his way of telling me, saying, like, keep doing what you're doing. Something will pop up at your doorstep. And, you know, I still have the screenshot of that text. Actually, I look at it every now and then because it's so true. Uh, so, yeah, I have certain goals that I want to achieve. I would love to be in Philly one day and anchor in front of my family and friends. But if that comes about, that would be great. If it doesn't, you know, maybe something else great will come about. So I just got to focus on doing doing great work. Uh, and if I continue to do great work and, and challenge myself every day, an opportunity that's worthwhile, it, it'll it'll appear for me. Love that, Jason, especially because, I mean, it's good to plan for the future, of course. It's good to have, you know, short-term, long-term goals, but, you know, you don't want to get too lost in the present. You need to take care yeah. of what you're today. Right. Um, that's how you're going to stand out in the workplace. Mm -hmm. That's how you're going to have more opportunities coming your way. Um, yeah. so I'm at a point. That. I'm at a point in my career where it's like, you're not going to get the jobs that I would attain for, you got to be really good. Mm -hmm. to get them. So, you know, I can't get lost in so lost in trying to get somewhere. I'm not focused on the present and getting better every single day. Of course. Well, Jason, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know um, I had told you this when we were planning the interview, but you are my dad's favorite uh, anchor in the Bay Area. Um, thank you. So, Tell yeah. him I said thanks. We appreciate his viewership. I, I, I mean that. Yeah, no, he's going to love this interview. Um, and our, all of our viewers are going to really love this interview. Just hearing about your professional journey, the amazing opportunities you've had, um, your emphasis on storytelling, I think is really, really important. Um, companies hire storytellers and you create mm -hmm. stories by having new, unique opportunities, doing cool things, uh, standing out. I think that um, everything you really spoke on today is really brilliant. And just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, just shoot me a text. Let me know where I can uh, check this out and I'll plug it and, and put it out there on the Twitter sphere and all the other cool things. Appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Have a good week. All right, man. You too. I'll see you. Bye.